Welcome and aloha. Thanks for joining us at Think Tech Hawaii, one of our last episodes of the 2022 year. Hope everybody is moving into what turns out to be a happy and fulfilling holiday season. And we're nearing the end of the Think Tech donation and fundraising period. For all of you who are willing to, please click Think Tech Hawaii, go to the donate button, and whatever you're willing to help support with would be most welcome. Today we have with us Professor Vernelia Randall, Professor Emerita of the University of Dayton School of Law, and the creator and generator of probably the most comprehensive compilation online of articles on race, racism, and the law called racism.org. Commend that. Lots of really worthwhile reading material on that site. And Jeff Portnoy, one of our leading First Amendment lawyers, civil litigators, partner at Cades, one of the largest and strongest supporters of nonprofits among the law firms in Hawaii. And that's certainly something to be proud of. And as we here in Hawaii you know, Jeff's also been a noteworthy commentator on University of Hawaii sports among his many attributes and a board member and longtime supporter of the Manoa Valley Theater, one of the leading exponents of local theater here in Hawaii. So thank you folks for joining us. And in the thought of maybe ending this year on a little bit higher note than some of the occasions we've had to deal with, um, what for you folks have been some of the highlights that give us a little bit of light and hope for the coming year and years? Professor Randall? The most pessimistic person. I actually, <laughs> I, I, I tend not to be a best case scenario person. I, I tend to want to look at the worst case scenario and be pleasantly surprised when it doesn't happen. But I have to admit, I've been thinking a lot about Judge Jackson. Supreme Court Judge Jackson, who just, uh, you know, she was just seated this summer. And she's done some stuff to surprise me. And I'm looking forward to her jurisprudence with hope that she will take the same surprise on quality immunity. But a couple of the things that she's done that surprised me that is outside the normal mode for justices is um, uh, her questioning in oral arguments has been, as far as racial issues concerned, to the point on several, uh, in pushing people to think about the impact of a rule that they want to impose, how it would impact minorities and and uh, uh, she's asked questions about, um, uh, she's just recently asked questions about uh, the election law that is going before the Supreme Court and that tends to want, uh, if the Supreme Court accepts Texas argument, it would allow them to overlook uh, the cons their pl the plain meaning of their constitution on the idea that legislators have the power to pass laws uh, and consequently could have pass election laws that are inconsistent with the state constitution okay and she asked them uh well then what would prevent them from passing, uh, isn't it, well, that I'm thinking I'm mixing up another instance. She asked them, she said, uh, if the constitution is supposed to be the supreme law of a state, of a country, and the constitution is what puts in force the legislature, 
how can the legislature then pass a law that would uh, override the Constitution, state Constitution? On another occasion, she asked them about whether or not uh, the uh, on, in a different case, and I'm going blank right now, about how uh, the whether or not race would be covered, whether or not it was in the case where the people were just wanting to discriminate, it was discrim wanting to discriminating, uh, discriminate against LBGTQ on state law. And she was asking whether that interpretation would allow them that, to discriminate based on race which historically uh, the Christian race, uh, the Christians have uh, used race discrimination historically, and it's only been in the last 50 years that uh, Christianity in America overtly steered away from racial discrimination. Uh, it, it was seen as justified by the Bible and taught that way. And then the third thing that she's doing, and this, this is not particularly uh, overtly the, uh, related to race, race, but it's important, and I hope the other uh, liberal justices adopt her, uh, what she's doing. On on a couple of emergency orders where they deny um, uh, denied a stay on an execution, a lot of times the justice just, just agree or disagree. Uh, but she actually wrote out an order. She wrote out a not an order a uh, an opinion. It was in a minority opinion, but it was an opinion on why she disagreed. That's essential for judi for legal arguments uh, to be. You can argue that the justices didn't agree with the outcome, but if they don't write an opinion as to why they dis uh, disagree, then it becomes hard. Uh, more difficult to argue the basis of their disagreement. Uh, and so I, I'm hoping that uh, she does more of that and that other justices, particularly the progressive branch, uh, the so-called liberal branch, they're not liberals, I just have to put that in. Uh, <laughs> The so-called liberal branch, uh, I hope they would write more uh, opinion. So I've been pleasantly surprised by her. So, so yes. So uh, those are great insights. And we noticed that Judge Jackson, right in her very first week, came out strong and took the time and trouble to correct Justice Alito and some of his teammates on the real meaning and intent of the 14th and 15th amendments. Yeah, the or originalist argument that the uh, that uh, conservatives like to go to, except when it doesn't support their view of the world. No, that's right. She did do that. So she's been a great surprise for me. Right. And over on the other side of the fence, we've still seen Justice Alito go back to, hey, yeah, but what was happening back 250 years ago in the late 18th century? And that's where we're going to get our meaning. Were people really worried about gerrymandering? Well, probably <laughs> there have been no elections, so it'd be a little hard for that to be a primary concern. Uh, Jeff, some of your thoughts? Well, I think the results of the November elections were more promising than many expected and completed by what happened this week in Georgia. I think 
the Democrats no longer are beholden to Manchin and have enough votes now to do what they need to do without selling out to him. Uh, I think the demise of Trump clearly now being acknowledged publicly and I'm sure privately by the Republican Party, uh, even though, of course, he will still command 30 percent of the Republican primary vote. I think his legal troubles have expanded, particularly now with the tax conviction of his organization and the finding of additional documents in other locations. So I think there's some reason for optimism. You guys were talking about the court. I think if you're looking for something there, I think it's becoming a little more evident that Barrett and Kavanaugh aren't crazies. They may be conservatives, but they're nowhere near where the other two loonies are. Um, and that holds some hope, particularly now in the last argument yesterday on election law, where I think it's pretty clear that those two conservatives are not going to go anywhere near where their two colleagues are willing to go. I think they'll still side probably with a 5-4 or 6-3 majority, but I don't think it's going to be what North Carolina legislature and Texas thought. And I think, you know, I think on religious issues, Barrett and Kavanaugh are not going to be helpful, but they're at least willing to listen. And I think hold some hope that maybe some 5-4 majorities can be cobbled together by John Roberts. Um, you're looking for potential optimism. I'm not saying it's going to happen. But when you look at the other two on the court, there's no hope. Um, so, you know, I think there's some reason for a little optimism. I heard last night that um, I'm sure this will make the professor very happy that Biden, right after the holidays, is going to announce his attempt to run again. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, that will deflate any uh, possible primary battles, I'm sure in the Democratic Party. Um, so, you know, are things good? No, but I, I do think there's a beginning emergence, if I can put those two words together, maybe not, of a kind of willingness on the part of the majority of the public to find common ground. Um, that the extremes, both on the right and the left, have lost their luster. Um, there's still, I think, you know, 30% on each side, but that 40% in the middle is beginning to exercise its um, will. I think George is a perfect example. So... We'll see. I mean, I know you want another party or two or three, but yeah, but uh, Jeff, I stuck you said, with the two. <laughs> Jeff, you said that the last time, and I thought about it the whole last two weeks because uh -oh. I think that that's a wrong statement. The fact is, is people are not given a progressive choice in the in the elections, and the primaries are controlled by the by the party in such a way that they can direct, that they can affect the ability of non-typical candidates to be even able to run. And I, I mean, so I, I don't think, and if you use Georgia as, a, uh, as an example, 70% of white people voted for, for uh, of, uh, white men and 68% of white women voted for Warren, uh, what's his name? I can't Walker. 
Walker. And and to me, on in various levels, that is the issue. When progressives that the majority, even in in so-called liberal states, the liberal white people, the 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 white people who vote for a conservative candidate is a significant portion. And if it wasn't for, and this is probably what scares people, if it wasn't for the uh, the, the percentage of uh, non-white people in those states, then it would be even worse. I don't think this is a sign of people, the, the middle not wanting progressive ideas. I think it's a sign of people not given progressive choices. So how can they want it? If they if the only choices they have is a far right wing conservative and a moderate Democrat, yeah, they're choosing the moderate Democrat. When they can when when they consistently have a choice, look at Seattle, would look, look at a, a, a real progressive they they hear the ideas that progressive put forth and they want those uh ideas they are not wanting the middle they're just given no other choice yeah well, i think you know you and i don't agree on that and i appreciate your your thoughts i i think the so called progressive movement is relatively small oh. and i think it has shown that it does not uh um uh, engender a significant even minority of votes and i did a lot of traveling this year uh in the midwest and i've also been to san francisco la portland seattle those cities are a disaster and i can understand from spending time in those cities and talking to people why people are upset with certain progressive views which have in large part decimated those cities they are decimated i was in portland last week it's a war zone downtown portland the homeless are everywhere la has eight blocks of continual homeless san francisco if you've been you can't go to union square anymore and then you go to the midwest and you see what's happening in in smaller yeah. cities. Well, wait, wait, let me finish. Let me finish. Let me finish. I just think, you know, I hear what you're saying, but progressives have run in primaries. And some they of them don't won. run that often. And they no, don't, and they don't, I, and, I agree. And they don't, and they don't, they don't, they they get set up to lose. And having lived in a Midwest city for 30 years, I tell you how we control. Uh, homelessness, we criminalize it. We put the people in jail. We we say you can't do this. You can't be here. You can't sit here. We 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 make yeah. the sitting things where they can't even sit down outdoors. We make it illegal to give food to people who are hungry. We 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 send the camps as far out from the view of any. Persons whose eyes would get upset. It's not that all these Midwest cities don't have problems with homelessness. They just have choose to criminalize it and and put people in jail. Yeah, I mean, I, it's a choice. No, and I I, I was but only at, but yeah, for me for me I would. Yeah. I would like I would like to see them be able to do something with homelessness, and I think our part of the problem with homelessness is our views about helping people. Yeah, we no, want, I, I, we I, want people to get off of drugs. We want people to stop drinking alcohol. We want people to do all these things to prove they deserve help. Instead of saying we want to put people in home, we don't care if you drink. We don't care if you do all this other stuff. We want to take you off the street and put you in a home, and then we will provide whatever services you need. But the Midwest, 
haven't dealt with homelessness in a way that, and, and when we talk about criminalizing homeless, that means it's going to disproportionately affect black and brown people. Yeah, and I was only using that as a single example of why people may not share uh, I hate to use the word progressive because it, it's a large spectrum, uh, you know, of, of views. But, you know, look, it's not like the country hasn't had historically uh, so-called progressive candidates. Henry Wallace ran for president. How did he do? I mean, he was he was about as progressive, quote unquote, he was a socialist. Uh, and and, uh, you know, I mean. All I'm saying, and I know your view, you have two parties and one tries to get more electoral votes than the other. So you have to pander, and I use that word advisedly, to the middle. I, I don't disagree with that. And I think, you know, you have a shot in some congressional districts for more extreme candidates on both sides. But that's the system. And I don't see it changing. I mean, we've seen a bunch of third party candidates fall on their face uh, over the last 50, 60 years. But maybe you do. I mean, maybe you see an opportunity for, you know, I mean, Trump could run. Uh, he's not going to get the Republican nomination. We may have three choices. <laughs> well, I, you know, I don't see the system changing anytime soon, but I do know touting it as the best we can have. And and then encouraging people not to think critically of how come the system acts so poorly. I mean, the thing is, is the middle. Who is that? Who is that? People who don't want to feed people, people who don't want to educate people, people who don't want to house people. Does the middle really say that's who they are? People who are only concerned about how much taxes they pay, maybe that is the middle. But it's a wrong-headed view of how our country should go. I guess it depends where you live of who's in the middle. Because I think the middle in Idaho is not the same as the middle in Massachusetts. So I hear you. I'm, I'm not, we've had an engaging conversation throughout the year, which I've really appreciated. And, you know, I, I uh, listen, if Donald Trump gets in, we won't have a constitution. So there you go. You won't have to worry about the constitution anymore and what the and, meaning of the 14th and 15th <laughs> amendments are. <laughs> and maybe we, I, and I'm saying this, not counting to Donald Trump, but maybe if there was a direct overt thing, we would have more people who would turn out in the streets violently and say, this is unacceptable. You can't do away with our constitution. You can't do away with our rights. Uh, this, the system, the way the system is set up, the, the political system is set up now, it has been moving everybody to the right. So yeah, when you talk about the middle, the middle has been moved to the right because the Democrats have moved to the right and the Republicans have moved to the right and there's been no counterbalancing. Here, I would like to have us, I, I would put out a suggestion for anybody. I would say one suggestion to, to help kind of equalize thing in this system is to have everyone participate in an elect in a uh, <laughs> me out. everyone participate in debates publicized national debates if you want to be a candidate you can you will be able to participate and you can't be ruled out until the debates happen. And how and 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 then how people kind of 
I don't think you can get an honest opinion of what people want if people never hear the voices and maybe the voices of people who are really different, people like me, people who say we can have a country. That when we were taxing people at 90 percent, the, the excess tax at 90 percent in the eight, 70s and 80s, the, we uh, 60s, 70s, the economy was better. Maybe we've got to tax people. Maybe the, the problem we have, and this is the this is the 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 left problem, is they don't want to tax either. They they and and it I I it's probably as you say is about getting elected, and they think nobody everybody thinks they're going to be a millionaire or a billionaire. And so when you start talking about taxing even high rich people, they don't people people don't want that. I I understand that, but it's doable. The and in our, in our last minute, oh, it happened really quick. Thanks for bringing up Justice Jackson, Jeff. Any heroes or unsung heroes of 2022 that? Oh, I'm Are sure there's fighting? lots of them, but they're not in the political arena. I mean, there's there's lots of people who have done absolutely incredible things. Uh, you know, I we could spend hours on all of the people who have been involved in issues that are important, I think, to me and to many others. I, I can't think of any political heroes on either side this year, but, you know, there's lots of heroes out there uh, that are doing great things every single day and uh, most don't even get recognized. So, yeah, there's lots of heroes. And, you know, I mean, if you're looking for one political quote unquote hero, just look at the Ukraine and, and Times Man of the Year. That's certainly the singular hero politically. But there are thousands of real heroes that you never hear of that are not in politics. No, and that's a great point to end on. There's certainly first responders in healthcare. Professor Randall, you've spent years in nursing and you know what it is to go through that. First responders in education, our teachers, dealing with the conditions of the pandemic. All of those first responders to the incredible disconnections and marginalization of people from each other. Um, and all of the people who, I mean, you, the first responders, but all of the people who were not considered uh, people who worked in service industry, but not at that kind of level, you know, people who collected our garbage and uh, all of those people, uh, people who continue to work in restaurants and stuff uh, and who still do. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, help people. A, and that's a great way to wind it up. To all of those who helped enable us to get through our daily lives as intact as possible. Our thanks for 2022. Blessings. Thank you from Think Tech Hawaii. Thanks, Professor Randall, Jeff. For Thank your you. And insights and aloha. It's been fun. Aloha. Yeah. <laughs>